Good evening and welcome to JT Online, our midweek Bible study. My name is Pastor Mark and it is my privilege to welcome you to our JT Online midweek Bible study tonight. And tonight is November 18th, Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. Hard to believe that we are just a week away from Thanksgiving, right? Hard to believe that, I know. Well, we're glad you're here and uh, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and uh, share the stream. I say that every night, uh, every week, but uh, go ahead and share the stream, hit the like, hit the love button. Uh, let us know you're here and also go ahead and put in your comments. Some of you have already uh, said hello, but go ahead and uh, let us know where you're watching from and uh, maybe something exciting that's happening in your life right now. Boy, wouldn't that be great? And we always love good news. And so often we're focused on all the, the bad things, but we'd love to maybe not so much something exciting, but something you're grateful for because we're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, why don't you put something in the comments that you are so grateful for? And I don't care if you put two or three or four things. Have you ever done that exercise where you you take just 60 seconds with a, a blank sheet of paper and a pencil and just start writing down all the things you're thankful for? It's amazing. The list just goes on and on. Well, while you're putting in the comments what you're thankful for, uh, I'm going to share just a couple of quick updates with you about some things going on in the life of our church. First of all, Speaking of Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving celebration is this coming Tuesday, November the 24th, just a little less than a week away. And here's the deal. Today's the deadline to sign up. If you have not yet registered for our Thanksgiving celebration on Tuesday, December or November 24th, you got to do it by midnight tonight because it shuts off at midnight. I mean, literally, it shuts off. Don't call here tomorrow going, oh, I didn't get to sign up. Go ahead, do it right now. Go ahead and register uh, for yourself. And if you're bringing anybody with you, go ahead and do that. Take care of that right now. Don't forget, you want to be a part. I think I heard earlier today that we've already got over 200 people registered uh, for that. It should be a fun, fun time together in our fellowship hall. Now, what's happening uh, after tonight? Because tonight is our last journey together for our fall part two. We wrap up the, our study of the parables of Jesus tonight. And so what happens next week and the week after that? Well, I'm going to give you some information. So if you want to take notes, go right ahead. Uh, this information also will be online as well. But next week, we don't have anything on Wednesday night because of our Thanksgiving celebration. Tuesday takes the place of Wednesday, so to speak. But there is nothing going on on Wednesday night. Um, and then the following Wednesday, which I believe is December the 3rd, is uh, we're back on campus and that is a uh, where it's a, a gathering we're having in the fellowship hall for all the adults. The preschool ministry will continue on, children's ministry, student ministry, they'll all be having their normal stuff. But all the adults will be in the fellowship hall for a Christmas Bible study part one. And that will not be streamed. I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, you got to be here in person for that. Uh, we have committed to streaming the midweek Bible study. So when we're doing those, we will be streaming those. But this is not one of those and we won't be be able to stream that. And then the next week's the exact same thing. Stuff for all the kiddos, students, but all the adults will be in the fellowship hall. That's, uh, I believe, December the 9th for our Christmas Bible study part two. Keep moving forward with me to December the 16th, and that is going to be a fun night you don't want to miss. That's McGregor Family Christmas Night, and there'll be a program beginning at 630 in the fellowship hall. We'll have several different choirs singing, uh, we'll be singing carols together. The, uh, the Christmas story will be told. Uh, just a lot of fun in that program in the Fellowship Hall. And then we do our tour of the campus where you have a chance to go around and see all the amazing decorations on our campus, get to go into the offices that are decorated. Just a fun, fun, fun church family night. And I would encourage you to be here on December the 16th. Now, I left off some of the other December events. You can go online and see that. I'd going on memory here, and I can't remember all the, the Christmas program dates for the church and all the different things, but there's a lot of stuff going on in December, so I would encourage you to, uh, to make sure you have kept up on what all's going on. Let me go back and see who all's joining us. Hey, Mary Ellen, and hey, Nancy, hey, Daryl and Carol, hey, Todd, um, hey, Stan. Good to see you, Stan. Um, let's see, anybody? Uh, Deb says, hey, Deb, she's grateful for her McGregor family. Me too, Deb. That's a good one. Um, Don and Bev watching from Shell Point. Greg watching from Indiana, and he is grateful for these broadcasts, able to keep in touch, and we still miss you, Greg. 
Uh, grateful we're able to do these and keep in touch. Linda's watching also, and she praises the Lord that they served 146 families in our McGregor Food Pantry today. Awesome, awesome. That is so cool. Uh, hey, Debbie, uh, coming from us to us from the mountains in the Anakista Mountains in Gatlinburg. Awesome. We had a little cool weather here. It felt nice this morning, 60 degrees. Loved it. Loved it, loved it. Hey, Bruce and Carol also watching. Glad to have you guys watching as well. And still, even though we're going to be switching over shortly to uh, H100, go ahead and uh, as you think about something you're grateful for, go ahead and put that in the comments. Be an encouragement to each other. I think we need to be reminded of all we have to be thankful for. And Linda just said she's thankful for the cooler weather. Amen. Me too, Linda. Well, as I said earlier, we're wrapping up our Parables of Jesus study. It's been a great study. 14 weeks, 14 different parables we've looked at. And as some of those have even combined, we've had a couple of different parables in the same week. So we've looked at over 14 parables. But tonight we wrap up, we're looking at the parable of the 10 talents. And it's in Matthew chapter 25. It's literally the next verse after what we looked at last week, the parable of the 10 virgins in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Now we're Matthew 25, 14 through 30. So let me uh, let me pop over and uh, see. Uh, it kind of looks like Pastor Russell might already be praying. So we're going to switch on over. And uh, when he wraps up with a Bible study, we're going to come back and I will wrap us up. So we'll see you at the end. Take care. We, we deal with the, uh, the last of the parables in this series is the last of the parables in this great sermon that is generally known as the Olivet Discourse or the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Uh, again, the different Gospels are designed and, and framed in different ways. Um, Luke claims, he's the only one of the four that claims to be writing an orderly historical account. In fact, Luke gave us a two volume history that begins with the birth of Jesus and the events around the birth of Jesus, and it ends with the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul in Rome, because Luke, Acts are a two-volume work addressed to someone named Theophilus. If you ever read the introduction to the book of Acts, it says, the former treatise, or the former volume, O Theophilus, I wrote, to begin to tell about the things that Jesus said and did. So Luke Acts are Luke's two-volume orderly history from the birth of Christ to the early A.D. 60s. So they function in that way. John is the experiential history of what it was to be an intimate follower of Christ from one of his most intimate friends. Um, it is designed around seven big miracles that John calls the signposts. It's a term John uses, and you can, you can if you ever want to outline John, you can go signpost, signpost, from, from the uh, water into wine at the wedding of Cana is the first, to the resurrection of Christ is the, is the last. And that's how John is arranged. I am standing here now. I told you I did inadequate prep for tonight. I don't remember Mark's organizational scheme standing here, but you can bet he's got one. Matthew's organizational scheme is around these major sermons. The first of them in Matthew is the uh, Sermon on the Mount. There's a bunch of material about the nativity, but obviously Jesus is not preaching during all that because he's just a little guy. Um, but as the curtain comes up on the public ministry of Jesus, the first major sermon in Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. It's three chapters, five, six, seven. It's even in terms of chapter count than this last big sermon of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, which is the Sermon on the Mount of Olives, which takes up all of Matthew 24 and 25. The sermon has two major sections that conveniently correspond to those two chapters. Uh, the part of the sermon that is captured in Matthew 24 is prophetic, and it lays out a chronology of the believer's expectations in the end game up to the rapture. And it's, it's laid out there in Matthew 24. Then, 
from the, from the prophetic section of 24, the sermon still continuing, it's still the same message, goes from a, a, a prophetic section to a parabolic or parable-driven section, which is largely 25. Now, there are some things in 25 that are not parable, but much of 25 is taken up with parables. And the common thread theme running through these parables is counterfeit belief. The fate of false believers at the end of things. We saw it last week with the ten virgins, right? Five that were prepared for the coming of the bridegroom, and five that would have said they were enthusiastic, would have given the first impression that they were all in, but when things were said and done, they weren't ready. And thus, they ended up excluded from the bridegroom's celebration at the end of things. The, the sermon ends with Jesus' description of the final judgment and separation of the sheep from the goats. Um, with the implication that the sheep and goats kind of mingle around together a lot until the end of things. This parable also speaks to false belief. I'm going to say this over and over and over again tonight. I'm going to wear you out with this. I'm going to make you roll your eyes. I'm going to say this so often. The theme of this parable is not do more and try harder. I have way more times than I'm happy about heard this parable taught as so Whatever else, you must do more and try harder. Because there's a guy in this parable that does not do well. He comes to an unpleasant end at the end of the parable. And there is a... It is quite possible to conclude that his major problem is he didn't do enough because he didn't try hard enough. Hermeneutics is not Herman Munster's cousin. Uh, hermeneutics, it's, a, it's, it's not an everyday word. Maybe it ought to be. Hermeneutics are your, are, is the um, discipline or practice of, of scriptural interpretation. In the singular, your hermeneutic is your that's that alarm panel and out there again. I recognize that pitch. It's right at the top of what my ears will still pick up. If you're older than 60 or 70, you might not even be hearing it because we all lose our hearing starting at the top end. If you're over 60 or 70 and you are hearing it, good for you. Your high-end hearing is still doing pretty well. If you're over 80 and you're still hearing it, you are remarkable. There's an alarm panel out in Main Street that's been giving us some intermittent fits of late. Um, your hermeneutic in the singular is the framework and grid you bring to the rules you have internalized for Scripture interpretation. Let me give you, let me install a component into your hermeneutic. Let me give you a hermeneutic rule that I think is an important one. As you have probably, as a New Testament believer, you have already accepted that the central message of this book is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, when you look at a given passage, when you look at a given event, when you look at a given chunk of Scripture, you should be looking for its gospel applicability. What does this passage tell us about the gospel? How does this passage lean into and shed light on the gospel? Good. If in reading a passage, you are at First, prone to conclude, well, this passage is saying that in order to, to please God, what I really need to do is work harder and try harder and do more. If you see that, and there are certainly passages that encourage ethical and moral behavior. I'm not saying there aren't. But when you see a passage and you're tempted to conclude the main thrust of this passage is we've got to do more and try harder. In light of your 
hermeneutic commitment to the gospel, a yellow flag should go up. Not a red flag, but a caution flag should go up in your interpretive exercise where you go, well, but, but, the, but everything points to the gospel and certainly do more, try harder is not the gospel. I wonder what else might be going on here. And very often, you go back through the text with a fine-tooth comb and an alert heart and a sensitivity to what is this saying about the gospel, you can find pretty clear indications, as I think we do here, that what's in view here is extraordinarily centered on the gospel with some encouragement to faithful living as well. All right? So, this parable is not teaching that you must do more and try harder. This parable is not teaching that you must do more and try harder. This parable is not teaching that in order to make God happy with you, you really better perform. That is not the theme of this parable. Okay? I'll say that again, maybe a couple more times. And that way, 15 years from now, if you're in a setting where somebody says it is, you'll roll your eyes, elbow your spouse, and say, oh, no, it isn't about doing more and trying harder. Roman numeral one, the responsibility we receive. The responsibility we receive. Verses 14 and 15 of Matthew 25. Here we go. I cheat and print out a larger print version of the passage I'm specifically dealing with to supplement my Bible because in addition to my ears aging, so are my eyes. For it will be like it being the kingdom. He's, he's already said the kingdom of heaven will be like uh, up in 25.1. So we're to understand the antecedent of it to be the kingdom. He's continuing to talk about the kingdom. The kingdom will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants um, and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Um, Got to clarify um, the word talent here. Um, it does not mean ability. It is not the English word talent as in you got a real talent for singing or dribbling a basketball or playing the piano or painting well. That is absolutely not, not even related to what this word means. Um, we do that in English all the time, right? Same word, same letters, same pronunciation, entirely different meaning. We have lots and lots of words in English that, that do that. A talent is a unit of weight. A talent of gold would be quite a lot. A talent of silver, a bit less. A talent of bronze, even a bit less. It was usually used as a weight for precious metals. Jesus here in his fictional storyline of his parable has not chosen to tell us what it's a talent of. The implication seems to be that it's, that it's quite, quite a bit of worth here. Um, so he could, have, he could have been imagining a talent of gold, which would mean the guy that got five got quite, quite a little fortune. Um, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. He got, he got a five weight of value. Again, do not mistake talent or talents in this parable for specific abilities. He got five talents. He can play the trumpet. He can dance. He makes great cookies. He can, no, 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 no. That is not what is in view here. He got, he got five chunks of precious metal is in view. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. It's like an auction. If I see any hand movement, you may have just bought something. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, there, are three, there are three characteristics um, that we see right away in this, in this responsibility. Number one, we see that we are entrusted. He, he entrusted to them. There was, a, there was a, a giving over of trust. One of the... Uh, 
One of the, I, always, I always have fun with this question for my, my high school students. I teach acts over and over again now for years and years and years to high school students. One of my very favorite episodes in the book of Acts is the salvation of Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius is a, is a Roman officer. He's as Gentile as Gentile gets. But from living among the Jews, he's been stationed at the, at the Roman capital, Caesarea by the sea. Um, and he has come to be one who has an interest in the God of the Jews, but just doesn't know how to get to him. One day, as he is praying, an angel appears to Cornelius and says, you need to send some guys up the coast. There's a guy named Peter who's staying in the house in Joppa, in the house of Simon, who's a leather, a tanner, a leather maker. Go, go send your guys, get him, and when he gets here, you um, ask him how you can know me, how you can know God, says the angels. The angel's not... God is an angel. It's a, it's, it is an angel as you think of an angel. And off the angel goes. All right. I always ask my high school students this question, or this series of questions. You're smarter than they are. You'll get these. Who, who moves with greater efficiency in obedience? A saved human being or an unfallen, sure enough, angel who takes his orders more efficiently, the human or the angel? Not a tricky question. Angel, of course. All right, good. Who moves with literally greater rapidity from point A to point B? If they're literally traveling, who's, who's going to be able to hit speed better, a human being or an angel? Angel wins that again. When a given thing needs saying, when a given verbal message needs delivering, who's more likely to get it precisely right? An angel or a human? Angel wins that one too. So in Acts 10, the time is drawing near for the salvation of Cornelius and his household. God's got an angel standing right there in a conversation with the guy. Why doesn't the angel go ahead and share the gospel and lead him to Jesus? He would do it faster, he would do it more efficiently, and he would get the words more perfectly right. Why not the angel? I think it's a really fair question. And it really does come back to the point I'm making in this parable. I haven't just randomly gone sideways, though I am prone to do so. Why not the angel? Don't overthink it. Is that because the angels can't understand how a person gets saved? I think they can grasp it. They certainly can't experience it. To your point, they don't have any experience with, with salvation. Think, think shallower. You get, that's a great answer articulate the dive planes and come up about 50 feet closer to the surface. Whose job is it to share the gospel? Yeah. The, the answer that I take on a test when I ask them that question on a test, why didn't the angel share? The answer I'm looking for, it's not their job, right? And for, for the reasons of that, they haven't experienced salvation. They cannot give a salvation testimony. They don't know what it is to be lost and then found. Fallen irredeemably if you go back and do some angelology. But they don't know. They can't say, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. They can't give that testimony. It's, and it's not their job to give that testimony. Whose job is it? It's ours. We've been entrusted, just as the slaves in this parable. Y'all have got that. Not only are we entrusted, we are stewards. I grew up in, uh, in Southern Baptist churches. I've, 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 I've used the phrase, and I'm not far off being literally true, that I was dropped off in the nursery at First Baptist Jacksonville Beach on the way home from the hospital and, uh, you know, went from there. That's about right. Um, Mom and dad were very active church members loved, and, and, and loved Jesus, loved each other. 
Uh, but I, I grew up. And, and I, always, I always heard uh, people talk about stewardship, stewardship, stewardship. That's, that's my churchified vocabulary because my vocabulary is churchified because I grew up in such a churchified setting. Stewardship, stewardship. I just thought stewardship meant giving. I thought they were exact synonyms. I didn't realize until way, way later, way later than I should have, that giving and stewardship are not synonyms. Giving is one characteristic behavior of someone who realizes they are a steward. But stewardship does not equal giving. Stewardship equals management of something that belongs to somebody else. The owner is the owner. The steward is the manager. Thus, stewardship for the believer is our settled awareness that certainly with our material stuff, but radiating outward from our material stuff, our time and how we use it, our interests and how we aim them, our um, passions and how we fixate, what we care about, what we do, and of course what we own, our abilities, our talents, and I do mean like playing the trumpet or tap dancing. Those, none of those are ultimately ours, right? All of those belong to the Lord. Thus, giving just isn't that painful a thing. It's not mine anyway. So it ought to all be directed in ways that honor the Lord. And if that means from time to time I buy a new pair of New Balance shoes because my old ones wear out, I'm not dishonoring God by that. Difficult to live life barefooted all the time in this culture. Um, but it does mean that I pay attention to how stuff is managed because the, the owner is going to call me into account for how I manage his Time, stuff, energy, attention, all of it. So we are entrusted. We are stewards. We are also different in our abilities and gifting. Here, he, um, he gave five, and then he gave two, and then he gave one, each according to their ability. Now, step out of the parable into the application. Who is the designer of your Personality, abilities, proclivities, passions. Who did the blueprint on you? God, and he didn't do so haphazardly. There are, there are some people who serve the kingdom in ways that are scaled. And then there are others who serve the kingdom in ways that are less elaborate, less visible, less whatever. Doesn't mean their service is any less valuable. You're going to see that when the reckoning comes here. There, there are some hmm. I love teaching the Word of God more than I love just about anything else I do while I'm awake. A mom and dad who love Jesus Back then it was Sunday school, so I can call it Sunday school. Sunday school, preschool, Sunday school scripture memorization. I've got memories of that that are more clear than my memory of what I ate for lunch today. And RAs, if you grew up Southern Baptist in the era that I did, the 60s and 70s, you know about that. If you don't, it's, it was our Baptist Boy Scouts, in effect sitting around campfires in Florida State Parks at night talking about the Word of God with older, wiser men in that camping setting as a seven, eight, nine-year-old boy. Through it all, 
mom and dad loving Jesus. Mom and dad watching a Billy Graham crusade on television. Who does that? In the fall of 1971 is the moment of my new birth. Etc., etc., etc. If I come to age 58, nearly 59, and cannot competently steward the teaching of God's Word, something is horribly broken. Because God has given me a set up life designed to produce someone who is at least competent in handling God's Word. He's done exactly the same thing for you. And if you've been saved for a while, you should be able to look over your shoulder and see what he's been up to. And you go, well, of course, of course I'm, I'm decently able to do this for the kingdom. Look at the life story that he wrote for me so far, and it would be goofy if I weren't ready. And it doesn't just have to be teach the Bible on the internet uh, and to classrooms. It, it, might, it might be anything. <laughs> I jokingly say that one, one, one week a year, didn't get to do it this year because of COVID and VBS was so weird, but one week a year I teach preschoolers. One week a year. Preschool, vacation, Bible school, I tell the Bible story. I, I don't do that well. It, it wears me out. My, uh, my life story does not prepare me to hold the attention of four-year-olds. I love four-year-olds. I praise God for four-year-olds. But you know what I love more than four-year-olds is I love adults who are gifted, whose life story, whose abilities, whose, whose, who, who go into full-out serve Jesus rock and roll mode in a room full of four-year-olds. They're in their element. To me, it looks like a magic trick. If you can pull that off, you're a, you're a better man, better woman than I will ever be. It's not as much about the greater and lesser here. Greater and lesser is not the point. Difference is the point. God, God gives some people this set of gifts, and this set of abilities, this personality shape, this bent. God gives someone else a different one. And God gives you a different one, and God gives you a different one. And that's, that's the diversity of his kingdom, and it's a good thing. So we are entrusted, and we are stewards, and we're very different from one another. Here there are, there are five, two, and one. He could have said there were ten, nine, eight, seven, six, and some were gold, and some in bronze, and some in silver, and some in this, and some in that, and then making exactly the same point. He just made the point with an economy of words. We uh, have the responsibility we receive. And then... He went away. Then he went away. Last of verse 15. So here we are. Our, our, our master has departed on a journey with the implication he's coming back. In his absence, he has entrusted stewards with all sorts of different things. Now, what's missing from the no, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Never mind. Yeah. No, it'll, it'll, it can work here. Um, what's missing from the detail of the parable, but what you and I can add as background, is as we extrapolate this parable to the values of the kingdom, as we live between our master's departure and our master's return, as we are entrusted stewards with a, with a broad range of different gifts and abilities. We have also been commissioned. We've also been assigned. There is an implicit expectation that we will be productive with that which he's in, entrusted us with, that we won't be inert. Thus, Roman 2, the responses that we have, verses 16 through 18. We are saved, we are, we are Holy Spirit possessed, we are gifted, we are commissioned, we are assigned, and we are trusted. 
And all of that is true of you if you make your living as an artisan scented candle maker. It is absolutely true of you that you are spirit powered, gifted, commissioned, assigned, and trusted if you are an auto mechanic or a football coach or a IT person or a whatever you are. This is not about what you do for a living. This is about being a trusted servant of the king left with an assignment. Well, five and two behave in similar ways. I've called them five, two, and one. That's my name for the three servants. You can guess why. Five, two, and one behave in similar ways as we, as we read on. So he who received the five talents went at once and traded with them. That word trade doesn't mean that he merely bartered. The word there is he engaged in business activity. He took the five, he took the measure of wealth that he was left by the master and he went to work with it. He went to work on it. He went out and he did stuff. And he made five talents more. Pretty good ROI. So also, he who had the two talents made two talents more. Again, the point is not... Hmm, the point is each of them... First, each of, them in, each of them must have engaged in risky behavior. Risky behavior. Uh, I don't know if you've ever made a business investment that in a reasonable time frame you doubled your money. Most of us haven't. You can't do that. If somebody offers you a chance to double your money and there's no risk associated with you, with, with, uh, no risk associated with that, you're going to double your money without taking appreciable risk, they will lie to you about other stuff as well. Because they're lying. Any adult knows that. And so it is baked into the parable. Remember, parables draw on our common frame of reference. Parables draw on, okay, we get that, we get that. Five and two went out and doubled, which means five and two went out and said, ooh, there's some risk associated with that course of action. But you know what? My master... He's trustworthy. My master has challenged me to achieve. It's not mine, it's my master's. And he would want me attempting something. Because he's gracious. And he's ambitious for me. So I'll go for it. You say, well, I don't see risky in the text. No, what you see is doubling the investment in the text. You're supposed to know that's risky. It's, it's baked into the parable. So they did risky things. You know what I bet they also did? They did work. They are said, uh, five is said to have traded. That means engaged in enterprise. And two, he made two talents more. So in addition to the risk, there was also effort. They, they put their shoulder to it. The point of this parable is not do more and try harder. They desired to please their master. And they had a relationship with their master that made taking risks sensible. And they were willing to get up off their backside and do something. The heart of the matter is the relationship, not to give away the ending. But that's where we're headed, and you'll see it, I hope, clearly when I get you there. Number one, five and two did that. One, one went a different way. Verse 18, he who had received the one talent went, dug in the ground, and hid his master's money. He's not about to take a risk. He's not about... To, to, to exert himself. 
he has a lack of effectiveness and a lack of success. The contrast here is not mostly work versus lack of work. The contrast here is faith versus lack of faith. I know my master. My master knows me. My master loves me. I'm going to attempt risky things. I'm going to attempt bold things. I'm going to trust him enough that I'm going to try something ambitious for his glory. Well, I tell you what, I know him too, and I know him if he screws up, he'll, if you screw up, he'll zap you because he's mean. And I'm not about to try anything because my understanding of the character of the master is you get it wrong and boy, you're in huge trouble. So I'm just going to bury it and back away. See, it's not lack of effort that was his major problem. It was lack of faith that was his major problem. We'll see that. Roman numeral three, the reckoning we face. The master came home. Verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Five and two have identical results proportionately. Five has doubled. Two has doubled. Um, he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five talents more. Now, he's not bragging. The setting is a setting where, verse 19, they are settling accounts. Well, when you are settling accounts, you get the numbers right. He's not editorializing about his fantastic work as a servant. He's settling accounts. This is what I started with. This is what I've made. This is what I'm giving you back. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We'll talk about the rewards at the end. He spells out something more about that. But here we see foreshadowed in the kingdom of, of, of God, the reward for effective service is often the opportunity to serve more. If you are finding joy in serving the Lord for His glory and doing so in a trustworthy manner, even in human terms we know, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the finish to this old saying? If you really want something done, ask a, ask a busy person, right? Because people who are just well, I don't have anything going on, and I never get anything done. And I'm, you, they're, they're, you cannot say, well, they're, they're not getting anything done. They must have time. I'll give them my thing to do. No, it'll just go in the pile of things they're not getting anything done with. If you want to get something done, find the person who goes, you know what? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like overwhelmed, but I'm pretty steadily busy, and I'm having to crank out some output, and some things are having to get done. Can you handle this? Sure. It'll join the stream of things I get done, and I'll get it done. That's just in the human sphere we observe that. Well, since God invented human beings, a lot of things that are true of us, observably, even apart from spiritual lenses, they become more clearly true. Here God is saying, look, the reward in the kingdom for, for, for effective service is greater opportunities for service, which is all about glorifying God, which is all of our central passion. So it's a good thing. It's a reward. Identical results, identical affirmation, well-managed stewardship. But here comes one talent guy. One talent guy tells a different story. Verse 24. He also who had received one talent came forward saying, 
Master, I knew you were a mean jerk. Now I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he says. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow. That is, you're a thief. Gathering where you scattered no seed, you're a thief. You're, you're mean, you're hard, you have, a, you have an inaccessible heart, that's what hard means, and you go around taking things that aren't yours by right. I knew that about you. So I was afraid. I mean, if you are that kind of master, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be timid. I'm not going to try anything. I'm going to just think, ready? I'm just going to think conservatively with my resources and hope at the end I haven't screwed it up too badly. I'm not going to try anything. God is not a fiscal conservative. When you own everything, this is a footnote, when you own everything that exists, everything that has ever existed and can speak new stuff into existence with your voice, you're typically not stingy. Just a thought. <laughs> so I was afraid and I, I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you go. I wonder what he expects to hear. Because two out of three, it's been well done. Enter into my joy. <laughs> but his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. Notice he does not lead with his laziness. He leads with his wickedness. He leads with his lack of relationship to the master. He leads with his own sinner's unredeemed character. Sarcastically, and this is a hermeneutic key to this parable, he says, um, you knew you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Notice it's a question. He's not saying, you knew about me that I was a thief. He's saying, you say you knew those things about me? It's sarcasm. It's not affirmation of one talent guy's position. It's indictment of one talent guy's position. You claim to know of me that I'm brittle and mean and thieving. You have, you have mischaracterized me so fatally that your behavior is faithless. There are two real problems here. One of them is evident at a glance and a little bit of a problem. One of them, you have to look harder to see it, but it's the larger problem, which leads me to one of the great principles of the universe. I'm sure somebody else has a better name for it. I observed it, so I call it Howard's Observation. <laughs> Howard's Observation states that tiny little symptoms are usually huge problems. For example, um, oh, and the converse. Sometimes great big symptoms aren't that big a problem. For example, if you go out in the morning and you cannot start your car, you turn your key and you just get click, 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 or nothing. That's a huge symptom. My car is dead. But it's probably 60, 50, what does a car battery cost? Okay, let's say 100. It's a hundred buck, it's a hundred buck. As car problems go, if you get out for a C-note, you know, huge symptom, car dead. Pretty easy fix, small problem. If you're driving down the road tonight and suddenly you start to hear from something inside your car, it's a small thing, car doesn't feel any different, it's not running any different, it's just making a funny buzzing noise. You take it to the mechanic. 
Your entire transmission is gone. It's going to cost you $84,000. <laughs> Small symptom, huge problem. T there's a tiny little wet spot there on the, oh yeah, that's because the roof has failed. My garage is flooded. It's awful. No, you just need a water heater. Your water heater busted. I'm not suggesting that small. People will store it in your garage. <laughs> He's got a, he's got a, he's got a small, it's just a small problem. I didn't, I didn't do much with what you gave me. <laughs> you know, I, fi I figured, I figured you'd want me to protect it above all else. You understand that, right? I mean, you're a big, powerful master and I'm just a slave and, and, and it's kind of scary to try to please a master when you're just a slave. So, so what I did is I, I, I responded in, in my fear of you and I just, I, I put it in the ground, but hey, I, I brought it back. Wow, that, that just doesn't seem to be that huge a problem. But it, but it, but it speaks to something horrible. The master, uh, the master says, you, you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers. At my coming, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him. Well, I'll, I'll let me come back to that. Notice he is both wicked and slothful. The small evident problem is he didn't get anything done. The subtler but deadly problem is he mischaracterized the master. He mischaracterizes the master so badly it's indicative that he has no relationship with him at all. Remember, this set of parables is dealing with false belief. My older brother, Van, who's given me permission to tell this story, was uh, in the church. Just, uh, he was raised by the same parents. I am, you know, two years older, so pretty much parallel childhood. Never came to faith in Christ. Missed that. Had some things in his life that were really, 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 really ungodly for a whole lot of years. Every time he would come under conviction, he would just start doing more religious stuff take on one more volunteer role, make himself that much more available for churchified, kingdomified activity. He would do more and try harder and do more and try harder, hoping the sheer noise of his effort would drown out the still small voice of conviction because he was lost. Everybody loves him. My older brother, his name is Van. He's not hard to love. He's a, he's a very good guy. He would just crank up the church activity and crank up the church activity and crank up the church activity thinking that the core issue of his lostness, thinking that God must be demanding more of me, that the God who is at heart a hard taskmaster must just want more from me. That must be what I'm feeling in my heart, this, this unsettledness. It must just be that I need to do more. He was saved, I think 1993, if I remember right. You know what's funny? He doesn't do near as much for Jesus now as he used to do. He, he, he belongs to a church. He serves that, that body of Christ, even has couple of volunteer roles in that church, but he's not like a neurotic person on an amped up treadmill anymore, trying to drown out conviction by the level of his activity because he encountered who God really is, the God of grace and forgiveness, the God who transforms us to be sure, but does not stand over us, whipping our back to greater and greater frenzy of activity. You just didn't know me. You mischaracterized me. So take Roman numeral four, the reward we receive. Take, take the talent from him, take what I had originally given him, and give it to the guy that doubled the five. The guy that doubled the five can probably do great work with 11. For to everyone who has will, be, will more be given 
and he will have an abundance. That is the doctrine of rewards. It is also the way service in the kingdom works. The one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And verse 30 cements that this is talking about false belief. Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is terminology that consistently in the teaching of Jesus is a reference to hell. This parable is not about doing more and trying harder. This one is not cast out because he failed to produce. He's cast out because he didn't know the master. And because he didn't know the master, he could not produce. The not producing is the symptom, not the problem. The problem is he didn't know the master. So, I hope as you serve the Lord, you're taking on everything he's giving you to take on. I hope you are listening to his voice through his word and through the testimony of friends and the, and the uh, landscape of the body of Christ to serve him in an effective way with that over which you are steward. I hope occasionally you're trying something that might be a little scary because you know he loves you a lot and he has already gone to the cross to backstop your failures. Lord, you're going to be so upset at me if I get this wrong. He's going to be more upset if you don't try it. Take a flyer. He's got you covered. Don't be imprudent and foolish. I'm not advocating that. You know I'm not. But timidity in serving Jesus is a bad fit. It's, it, it can indicate a lack of faith to a small degree in the believer, to a deadly degree in the unbeliever. And if you're just, you're just not going to do that. All I'm going to do, God is big and scary, and I am scared of him, so what I'm going to really do strategically, I'm going to try to make it through life keeping my head down. So that at the very least, I won't tick him off inordinately. And so that one day when I face him, I can say, hey, God, I, I, I kind of kept inside myself and kept in my shell and kept it kind of late. I, I hope I didn't blow it too badly because I know that you're the kind of God that if I blow it badly, you're going to roast me forever. No, everybody blows it badly. It's that you didn't know me. That you've, you've gone through life with a strategic misunderstanding of who I am and how I relate to my people. The parable of the talents is not about do more and try harder. Did I tell you that? <laughs> the parable of the talents is about the gospel of Jesus Christ and a joyful people who know him, who are loved by him and who love him back and who go out and, and, and accomplish the glory and the foundation work of his kingdom. Let's pray together. Lord, it is not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to your mercy, you have saved us by your blood. Lord, thank you for the reminder. Lord, thank you for this semester. When I, when I found out from Bricker we would be doing parables, but not from Luke. Lord, a lot of the good parables, and you know you are the ultimate author of these books, a lot of the really good parables are in Luke and nowhere else. And when Mark came to me and said, we're going to do parables, but we're going to do them from Matthew, I remember arguing with him, and I was wrong. <laughs> thank you for the parables that are only in Matthew to which we have been able to attend. Now, Lord, bless us as we drive home. There's crazies out there. Thank you for the cool snap. Uh, thank you that it's no colder, that we're not shoveling anything or scraping anything, but we still maybe can wear a sweater in the morning if we want to. That's a grace gift, and I appreciate it. Be with us as we head home. Bring us back together on the Lord's Day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and good night. All right. Thank you, Pastor Russell. What another great Bible study as we wrap up the parables of Jesus. And you heard him say it. Mark was right. 
<laughs> I don't know about that. I don't think there's really much of an argument either. He's always very gracious in, uh, in following the direction our planning team puts together on what we're going to be teaching on these uh, midweek Bible studies. And by the way, I mentioned it at the beginning, in case you missed it. This is our last one in our series, The Parables of Jesus. And we'll be taking a break from these Wednesday night midweek Bible study uh, online courses until January when we kick back off. We have some things, different things going on on campus on Wednesday nights, uh, but uh, just be looking out for when we kick back off. It'll be January 13th will be our first Wednesday night back. And so be looking for details in uh, around McGregor email or online at mcgregor.net. One final announcement. Uh, tonight at midnight is the deadline to register for our Thanksgiving celebration coming up this Tuesday. This Tuesday. Nothing happening on Wednesday next week, but Tuesday we have our Thanksgiving celebration in the Fellowship Hall with a program and a great meal. Go online, mcgregor.net, to register tonight. Buy tonight or it's too late. Thanks again for joining us and being a part of our midweek Bible study, JT Online. And again, this is the last um, Wednesday night we'll be meeting until January. So uh, it's been a great time together, and I know we're going to miss uh, miss meeting like this, but we'll be back in January. God bless, and have a great evening.